Hello Year 10, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Miss Roper. I'm just going to spend about half an hour or so revising and talking through some of the key points regarding London and checking out my history from the Conflict and Power Poetry Anthology. Okay, now I'm sure you'll be familiar with the assessment objectives for literature for all of those literature texts that we've looked at so far. So for poetry, you'll be assessed on three areas. Assessment objective one is to read, understand and respond to texts. Now, in simple terms, that means that you've got to understand what the poem is about and you've got to be able to select quotations or evidence to support that that is what the poem is about. Assessment objective two, you have got to be able to analyse the language, form and structure used by the poet to create effect. So with poetry, we'll be looking at things like simile, metaphor, personification. We'll also be looking at structural techniques like enjambment, um, volta, caesura. You might be looking at rhyme, rhythm. You may also be looking at the form of a poem. So for example, whether it's a sonnet in the example of Ozymandias or something like that. You can also, for AO2, talk about sound devices because poetry is supposed to be listened to and read out loud. So some of you may have discussed with your teachers the use of techniques like sibilance, for example, in some of the poems. And then finally, assessment objective three is your ability to show understanding of the relationships between the texts and their contexts. So that means that you've got to show understanding of either the time that the poem was written in, or you've got to show understanding of some of the influences on the poet when they were writing their poem. Our big question then for today is how is power in society presented in London and checking out my history? So in answering that question, we're going to revise those two power poems. We're going to consider the two poems in comparison to one another because I myself know that perhaps we didn't have enough time to practice writing about poems in comparison. And we're going to be analysing a range of key methods used in these poems. We're going to focus on language, structure and imagery mainly. Now, just to sum up, power in both of these poems, which I'm sure you're aware, the power that we see in London is the power of the government and the church and the control that it exercises over people in London. We're going to then think about the power that's shown in Checking Out My History, which is the power of the education system. Okay, so we've already said that London is about the control that the government and the church have over the people living in London, particularly the working classes. So one of the easiest methods that you can comment on is the language that the poet uses. Now, some people panic about having to learn quotations for their exam because obviously a lot of that has to be from memory. So an easy way to combat that is to learn a semantic field, so individual words that fit into a pattern. So if you look again at the poem London, you'll notice that William Blake uses words like woe, fear, cry, sigh and curse. Now, if you're unsure what the word woe means, it means sadness. So hopefully you can see that all of those words within that semantic field are negative. And they're all linked to misery, suffering and apathy. So we get the impression that the Londoners have lost all hope that their situation is going to improve. So they're living under the oppression of their leaders and it would seem that they accept it. They're not fighting back, they're not resisting anymore. So they seem to have become quite passive and quite demoralised. Now, if you wanted to stretch your analysis of this semantic field, you could actually look at some of the words individually. So, for example, if you were to take the noun, sigh, now that is what Blake is frustrated about. He's frustrated that people seem to have given up. They're no longer fighting back against their oppressors. 
So if you think about that now, people often sigh when they're in a state of despair. So it's almost like they have accepted their fate without a fight. So that is the source of Blake's frustration. He's almost angry at the people for not resisting. Now, if you wanted to link these words to AO3, to historical context, you perhaps would want to look at the cry, for example. So the cry is linked to the chimney sweeper. Now we should know that in the late 18th century, chimney sweepers were young children because they would fit up the chimneys, they were small enough. So what we're seeing there is that Blake is highlighting the suffering and misery of these children. They were being exploited, they were uneducated, they'd never know any different kind of life, they'd never know any better. You could also talk about the, the noun curse. So if you actually look at the context in which curse is said, it's linked to the youthful harlot. So the harlot being the prostitute, and we're told that the prostitute is cursing. Now, the harlot's curse could also be a reference to the fact that these prostitutes would sleep with men and they would spread syphilis which was a fatal sexually transmitted disease back in the 18th century. So if you were to sleep with a prostitute, then it would curse you because it would seal your fate and it would mean that you were doomed to die. Now, obviously we know in the poem that the marriage hearse is later mentioned, the hearse being the funeral car. So those men who contracted syphilis from the harlots, from the prostitutes, they would get married and they would transmit that sexually transmitted disease to their new wives. And the new wives would pass that on to their babies. So we can see that Blake is complaining about all of the negative things within London. And that's summed up by that semantic field of five words there. Woe, fear, cry, sigh and curse. Okay, so for the next key point about London, we're going to look at some of the imagery used. Now, I do appreciate that there's quite a lot of information on these slides. So if you listen to the voiceover, and then obviously you can take time at a later point to read through all the notes, but I am going to summarise them. So one of the metaphors that I'm guessing all of you will have looked at with your teachers is the mind-forged manacles. So hopefully you're aware that manacles are shackles or handcuffs or chains. So what Blake is suggesting through that metaphor is that the people of London, the working classes, are restricted in their thinking. Now, the main reason for that restriction of their thinking is because of their intellectual deficits or deficiencies. So the fact that most of them are uneducated means that they're not actually aware that they're being oppressed, that they're being downtrodden. So because they're unaware of it, they don't fight back against it. Now, if you wanted to stretch further your analysis of mind-forged manacles, you could say that Blake's anger and frustration is actually at the people of London rather than those in power. And the reason for that is because their ignorance means that they are enslaved to their masters. So just by their sheer numbers, the working classes, if they became aware of their oppression, they could join together and unite and they could actually overthrow the government. However, because they are ignorant and they're unaware of the fact that they're being mistreated, they don't fight back. So in some respects, they actually oppress themselves, they restrict themselves. And a way of keeping them under control is keeping them uneducated. Now, if you look over to the right hand side of that slide, you can talk a little bit further about AO3, historical context. So obviously, forged is a reference to iron work and the iron industry that would have been prevalent, it would have been very common in the 18th century, in the Industrial Revolution. 
So forging iron is a process that's carried out in a smithy where the iron is heated under very intense temperatures. It melts and then it's remolded into shapes and left to harden when it cools. Now, in that respect, it's suggesting that the government put so much pressure onto the minds of the working classes and they manipulate them so much that they remold their thinking and they allow it to set and harden. And once the minds of the working classes have hardened, it's impossible to change them. So once the people are quite happy, existing as they are, and they're unaware of their oppression, they cannot change their thinking. One way that you can actually achieve higher marks on your poetry exam is to talk about structure. Now, if we look at the structure of the stanzas in London and the rhyme scheme, you'll notice that it's a regular AB, AB rhyme scheme. So I've just quoted here for you, and this is all you'd need to do in an exam. Fear and hear, cry and sigh, curse and hearse. So we've got those AB, AB rhyme schemes there. Now, the use of that very rigid regular rhyme reflects the very rigid routine that the Londoners are enslaved to. And the fact that that rhyme scheme is never deviated from just reinforces all of those restraints imposed upon the people and the fact that nobody can break free from that routine. Again, if you wanted to stretch that a little bit further, you could look at how there are a number of end stopped lines in this poem, um, particularly at the end of each stanza. So end stopped just means that the line ends with a full stop, but it is a technical term. Now, all that does, using full stops at the end of the lines and the stanzas, it reinforces that this sense of finality to the Londoner's fate. So it's almost like they've chosen to accept that as their lifestyle and they're not going to rebel. They're not going to try and force themselves free. And that routine, that rigidity that the Londoners are stuck with is supported even further by the fact that every stanza is an identical length. So they're each stanzas of four lines. So we can see that the Londoners are stuck in a very strict, rigid routine. And that's what depresses Blake so much. Something else that may allow you to access higher marks with poetry is to recognise the poet's tone. So the feeling behind their, their writing. So if you look at the section in purple on this slide, in the first paragraph, um, we need to acknowledge that Blake's tone is pessimistic, which means hopeless. So he feels quite disillusioned and quite cynical. He's not expecting things to change because the Londoners won't fight back, they won't resist their oppressors. Now, a quotation that you could use to support that pessimistic tone is blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Now this is a metaphor, and as we said earlier, it suggests that all marriages are doomed in London. Because the grooms have gone out and slept with the prostitutes, those diseases, syphilis, will be carried back to the wife. So all of those marriages will ultimately end, sooner than expected, in death. Now if you wanted to stretch that further, you could therefore look at marriage and hearse next to each other, where the hearse is a funeral car. So effectively, that's acting as an oxymoron, two words which seem to be the opposite to one another. Marriage is often the signal of a new life starting, new beginnings, whereas a hearse is symbolic of death and life ending. So you can see that in London, Anything new and positive is immediately spoiled and ended with death or with misery. You might also want to talk about the noun plagues and that fits into a semantic field of disease and infection that runs throughout the poem London, linked obviously to prostitution. 
not only to prostitution, but also the fact that there was lots of disease because of overpopulation, poor sanitation. So, you know, people wouldn't necessarily use toilets as such. There was poor health care, poor diet. So all of these things added to the prolific volume of disease in London at the time. So if you look at that semantic field, you've got words like plagues, and then you've got verbs like blights and blasts. Now, blights and blasts are both verbs meaning to infect. So throughout this poem, we've got images of disease and infection. Again, just reinforcing how negative London is as a place to live in the 18th century. Okay, so having looked at some key quotations that are easy to learn, easy to remember, and are in support of how power is being presented in the poem London, let's just summarise some of Blake's key ideas. So Blake seems to be suggesting that institutions such as the church and the government abuse their power and they oppress people. Oppress means to, you know, to stamp them down, to keep them down. He also seems to be suggesting that lots of human beings accept, accept oppression passively. So they don't fight back, they don't do anything about it. And that depresses William Blake. Thirdly, he seems to be suggesting that ignorance, so a lack of education, makes you more susceptible to being oppressed. Now by that, what I mean is that the less education you have, the more unaware you are that you are actually being mistreated and the more unable you are to fight back. So it's, it's almost being suggested that education is power and these people unfortunately don't have education. And then finally he seems to be suggesting that there's power in numbers. So if only all of those people were to unite they would be able to challenge the power of those in charge, the church and the government. But unfortunately, they don't realise that they're being oppressed. As well as understanding William Blake's ideas, sometimes it's important to recognise the themes that his poem deals with. And that's because sometimes in the exam, the question will give you a theme-based um, essay title. So some of the themes that Blake seems to be addressing here are the abuse of institutional power, so how those in control abuse that control and that power, revolt and resistance. So in his poem, he does talk about, or he refers to the French Revolution when he talks about um, the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So he makes reference to the French Revolution where the French people actually united and they overthrew the monarchy. So Blake is a little bit disappointed that British people, the Londoners, can't follow that example. They can't unite and they, they seem to be unwilling to fight back. The third theme that Blake seems to be addressing is ignorance and passivity. So ignorance again is lack of knowledge or education and passivity is the idea that um, they accept it lying down. They don't challenge that authority. And finally, he seems to be dealing with the theme of the corruption of society, how the society is getting worse and worse, morals are becoming lower and lower, um, diseases were spreading and everything was going rotten. Okay, I shall largely leave this one for you to read through independently, but if I were to sum it up, if you are going for those highest grades, you may also want to talk about structure and sound in more detail. So when Blake uses verbs like blasts and blights, which I spoke about earlier, um, that BL sound, that bl sound, um, is what we know as a plosive sound because it explodes from the mouth. So perhaps it is used to express that pent up anger and aggression that he has at the people of London for not fighting back. He also uses another technique called anaphora, where he repeats the phrase in every at the beginning of clauses. 
to, there's the repetition of that phrase. Now the effect of that is that it suggests that the corruption in London spreads into every corner. It cannot be avoided. Okay, so moving on to checking out my history, where we said that power features not to do with the power of the government as such, or the power of the church, but more to do with the power of the education system and how it can uh, manipulate young minds. So in the same way that we did with London, one of the first methods that you should look at is the use of the words or the language that um, Agard uses. So again, easy quotations to remember. He uses a semantic field of language linked to light. So some examples of that would be vision, beacon, fire, star and sunrise. Now the significance of those words which are linked to light would be that they suggest that if we were to only learn about black historical figures as well as white historical figures, it would actually enlighten us, it would illuminate parts of history that have been previously ignored. So light is often associated with knowledge and darkness is associated with ignorance. So we can see that Agard believes that learning about different historical figures would actually be inspiring and it would illuminate certain parts of history. If you wanted to stretch that analysis further, you could take some of those nouns and analyse them in more detail. There's lots of information here which you can read through. I'll just sum up. Um, if you wanted to look at sunrise, well that noun, it's associated with the start of a new day, new beginnings. So perhaps Agard is suggesting that our education system in Britain needs reviving, it needs renewing, we need a fresh start. You might also want to look at the noun beacon. Now, a beacon is almost like a guiding light. So it suggests again that some of these black historical figures are actually figures that should be inspiring to us. They should guide us in the way to behave. And finally, the noun star. Well, if you think of stars being high up in the sky, then it suggests that these figures that he mentions in the poem are figures that we should look up to, they're role models. Now for assessment objective three, historical context, again there's a lot of information there, but when he talks about um, star and fire and vision, he's linking those images of light to black historical figures such as Mary Seacole. Now Mary Seacole was a nurse, um, what he does within this poem is he juxtaposes those black historical figures like Mary Seacole, who lots of people wouldn't have heard of, against figures like Florence Nightingale, who was also a nurse, but she was white and she's much more well known. So Agard is making the point that through our education, which is very limited, we seem to know about these white historical figures, but we don't know about their black counterparts. Um, within the poem, incidentally, he does also mention white figures like Robin Hood and Old King Cole, who are actually fictional characters. But again, if you ask most young people, have they heard of Robin Hood? They will have done. So the point that Agard is making is that our education system actually encourages, encourages us to learn more about fictional figures, made up figures, because they're white, rather than real historical black figures. And he finds that quite offensive. Okay, so like we did with London, we're going to look at some imagery next. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with this quotation. Agard says that he feels that the education system bandage up me eye, blind me to me own identity. So here he uses a metaphor and it suggests that when any child, particularly dual heritage children, show any keenness to learn about their own history, black history for example, that the education system in Britain treats them as if they need healing or curing. 
So a bandage is applied when you have injured yourself. So it's almost seen as if any inquiry into any other history that's not white is defective, it's wrong, and you need to be cured of that. Now the irony here is that by applying a bandage over somebody's eye so that they can't see half of history, black history, you're actually blinding them. Now the irony there is that education is supposed to enlighten you, it's supposed to illuminate things and allow you to see things more broadly. Whereas Agard is suggesting that the education system is limiting what he can see and the information available to him. So if you look down at the stretch it section, I know there's lots there which you can read in your old time, um, you might also towards the bottom of that section, bandages usually conceal sort of festering wounds. So that suggests that perhaps the reason the education system covers up black history is because there are some unpleasant parts of black history that white people or the white education system doesn't want people to see. So by applying this bandage, it actually conceals some of the, the bad things, the bad parts of history involving white people and their treatment of black people. Again, if you're able to talk about structure, you're actually able to access higher marks. So, a structural point that you could make about checking out my history is the anaphora used in the phrase dem tell me. So if you're unsure what anaphora is, it's the repetition of a phrase at the beginning of successive clauses. So it starts several of the lines of this poem, that phrase. Now, the effect of that anaphora is that it suggests that he has been told numerous times what he is supposed to learn and what he is supposed to believe by the British education system. However, the irony of that is the fact that it had to be repeated so many times to him implies that he's not listening and that he's not taking it on board. So he's quite rebellious. Now, that's quite interesting when you think about Blake and Blake's poem, because the Londoners just accept what they're told to do. Whereas Agard here seems to be ignoring it and fighting back and rebelling against it. The repetition, the anaphora used in Dem Tell Me, also suggests that the British education system is a fan of rote learning, which means that we tell you information and we expect you to learn it off by heart and repeat it over and over without you actually engaging your brains. So you could talk about that. If you wanted to stretch it further, and this isn't on the slide because I didn't want to overload it, you could also talk about the use of phonetic language, which is where words are spelt the way they would be pr pronounced. So Agard, coming from the Caribbean, would say dem rather than they. So he does that to assert his identity and show that he's proud of the way he speaks and that he's not going to conform to standard English. Just a bit of AO3, historical context. You might link this to the fact that in all of these faith schools that exist nowadays, for example, as they're called, and in places like Nazi Germany, which had an organisation called the Hitler Youth, the Hitler Jugend, um, lots of these organisations for young people, for children, are actually a means of imposing propaganda upon them. So if you take a group of young people before they formed their own ideas and you tell them what to believe over and over again, most of them will be indoctrinated. They'll be manipulated into believing those ideas. So Agard's poem, even though it's about school, he's making the same point that actually the education system, it teaches you what it wants to teach you and it censors other information. So effectively, it's brainwashing you. 
So it's important to be able to recognise the tone behind a poet's words. So when he uses the final line, I carving out my identity, you can see hopefully that his tone is quite rebellious and defiant. So he seems to be challenging the education system. So despite school telling him that he needs to know about white historical figures, he's determined to go out into the world and find his own culture and his own identity. So it's quite an optimistic, positive ending to the poem which again is in direct contrast to the end of Blake's poem, which ends with the words marriage hearse. So it focuses on death because the people in London aren't rebelling. Here, Agard is prepared to rebel and find his own future. So the tones of the poems are very different and that would be a really good point of comparison between the two. Now, if you wanted to stretch that a little bit further, you could focus on this metaphor of carving out his identity, where the verb carving, if you think of the action of carving, it is leaving like a deeply ingrained mark on something, on a surface, so it can't be wiped away easily. Now that suggests that Agard wants to leave his mark on history. He wants other black and dual heritage people like himself to leave an impression on you know, the future so that they will be learned about in history classrooms in the future. Um, you could also talk about how this is the final line of the poem. So where you would usually expect it to be end stopped, so to have a full stop at the end, it doesn't. Now, you could interpret that as being Agard's final rebellion against the British education system so he's defying the rules of punctuation. You'll notice that none of the poem has got any punctuation in it. So he's rebelling against, you know, conforming to punctuation and standard English, all of those rules. The fact that it doesn't end with a full stop also implies that his story's not over yet. So to prove that we can engage with the poet's ideas and intentions, these would be some of the key power points that he seems to make in his poem. So he seems to be suggesting that the education system has unlimited power in moulding the minds of impressionable young people. And that power is often abused if you look at bullet point number two. He then goes on to suggest that people who rebel against conformity, so against that, you know, fitting in and following the rules, are actually needed in society because otherwise nothing would ever change. So you need rebels to revolutionise outdated institutions like the education system. And then finally, he seems to be implying that the ruling powers, whether that's the education system or otherwise, they filter and censor education to suit their own purposes and their own political goals. Okay, so in the event that you're asked a thematic question, some of the themes that Agard's poem deals with is the power of education, the abuse of the education system and the abuse of institutional power which means, you know, organisations which abuse their power over the masses. Constructive rebellion, so this idea that actually being a rebel can be a positive thing. And then finally, it seems to deal with the theme of institutional racism, which means how, you know, in certain organisations like education, or it could be the police, that racism seems to be historically something that has been accepted and promoted in those organisations. Okay, so again, there's lots of information on this slide. For those of you aiming for grade seven and above, um, it focuses on some extra structural and sound devices that you might analyse in the poem. I'll just sum them up quickly. Um, we've already mentioned the lack of any punctuation in the poem to show his rebellion against educational conformity. Um, you could reiterate the fact that he uses enjambment, so the fact that each of the lines runs on into the next without any end stopping. 
that has the effect of showing his passion when he speaks. It's almost like a rant against the education system and he can't contain himself. You might also look at the fact that within the poem there are rhyming triplets and rhyming quatrains. So moon, spoon, balloon and maroon would be an example of a rhyming quatrain, four lines that rhyme. So that actually suggests that learning in our schools is quite repetitive and robotic. Again, we expect you to learn things off by heart without engaging with them or thinking about them. We mentioned the phonetic spelling that he uses in words like me for my or dem for they. And again, that's to show his pride in his own cultural identity. And finally, you might comment on the fact that the sections about black historical figures are in italics. Now, not only does that draw attention to them and make them seem important and add emphasis to them, but it also segregates them from the sections on the white historical figures. And he seems to be reinforcing there that segregation was still very much a feature of society at the time that he wrote the poem. Okay, so I now just want to talk you through a sample paragraph in response to that big question that we had. How is power in society presented in London and one other poem of your choice? So obviously we've picked Checking Out My History because they both deal with the abuse of power. So this would be my answer. William Blake and John Agar choose to focus on the power of human society and its institutions in their poems London and Checking Out My History. In both poems, the power of society is exercised through mass institutions, such as the government, church and the education system, respectively. In London, for example, Blake presents the government as inflicting mind-forged manacles, a metaphor suggesting that the Londoners' freedom of thought is restricted by their lack of education, their ignorance. This ignorance means they are unaware of the oppression they are living under, and therefore they do nothing to rebel against it. The reference to mind-forged links to the Industrial Revolution in which the poem was set, as iron was melted under high temperatures and then cooled to set, in the same way that pressure is applied to the Londoners to mould their mindsets. Similarly, in Checking Out My History, Agard presents the education system as neglecting its duty to provide children with a broad education that represents the multiculturalism of British society. By stating that they blind me to my own identity, Agard uses metaphor to imply that the education system is disabling and harming children rather than enabling and enlightening them. By restricting their access to black history and teaching only patriarchal white history, the British education system is abusing and misusing its power. The reference to the metaphorical bandage, which is applied to blind Agard and censor certain parts of history, could imply that the history the British education system is trying to conceal is unpleasant, just like a festering wound. This could be a possible reference to the historical white enslavement of black people. Therefore, Blake and Agard both focus on the abuse of power through societal institutions. However, Blake despairs at the Londoners' acceptance of their oppression, whilst Agard rebels against his. So that would be an example of a paragraph that you could write. So you can see the words that are in bold are connectives that show comparison. Now, depending on whether you're making a similar point or a different point, that will govern the connective that you use. So because I'm pointing out that both poems show the abuse of power, I use words like similarly. If I was pointing out a difference, I would use something like however. So one of the things that you need to do to show comparison is use connectives. Now I did want to highlight the assessment objectives, but for some reason it won't let me do it on this PowerPoint. So if you are able perhaps to print off this slide at some point, just grab yourself three highlighters and highlight those three assessment objectives. 
So a good candidate will address each of the three in their response. So if we start with AO3, because that's the easiest to identify, AO3 is where we talk about um, historical context. So you'll see in the William Blake section, I talk about the Industrial Revolution. So that shows that I, I have an understanding of the circumstances in which Blake was writing. If you look at the section on Agard's poem, I talk about how um, white people enslaved black people historically. So again, I have some understanding of the context which has influenced Agard's poem. For AO2, which is analysis of methods, I focus here on imagery. So wherever I talk about the metaphors, mind forge manacles and the bandage up the eye, I'm talking about AO2. I analyse the effect of those metaphors. Obviously, if you wrote more paragraphs, you might look at a structural technique or you might look at a semantic field. So this is just one example. And then AO1 is anywhere where we use quotations and you'll notice that the quotations are short and they're embedded into my sentences. So they're quite easy to remember. And AO1 is also where I answer the question. So wherever I mention power in society or words to that effect, it shows that I'm focused on the essay and I'm understanding what the poet's intentions were, how they wanted to present power. So perhaps go away and highlight the assessment objectives if you can. So my final top tips when you are writing your responses on poetry, power and conflict poetry, would be don't worry if you struggle to write comparatively. So what you can do if you struggle is write about one poem first and then link it with a single connective like similarly or however and then write about your second poem and that's fine. Remember also that examiners have said that you don't need to write an equal amount on each poem. So if the poem that you get given in the exam, because you get given one, isn't one that you're as familiar with, write a little bit about that and then move on to your second poem that you're more confident with and write more about that poem. Remember to address all the assessment objectives. So there are three, we've gone through them already. And remember that talking about structure and sound devices will allow you to access the higher grades. And finally, when you do talk about AO3, historical context, make sure that your comments are brief and that they're explicitly linked to the point that you're making. So don't write a history essay, just make a brief point that shows you understand why the poet wrote their poem.